I invite you to turn to Philippians chapter 1. We'll be continuing from where we left off last week, and I'll take a few minutes and uh, catch folks up if you've missed the last few. Uh, I've been a little convicted over the last uh, 45 minutes to an hour. I've had a tough time keeping my focus here. Uh, my son, Brant, who I went to visit uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, he delivered the sermon at the Ardmore Church this morning. He told me, now, Dad, I haven't announced my call to preach, but they, they ask if I would fill in, and so I'm, it's his second time to have done that. So uh, it was pretty exciting. Uh, I would call him, except uh, he might be like his dad and be long-winded, and it might not be quite finished yet. So uh, anyway, that's pretty exciting. Uh, we are looking at the subject we have been since the very beginning of summer of joy and laughter. You never can have too much. You only can have too little. Over the last several weeks, our attention has been focused on uh, the idea of joy, for it is out of the source of joy we have, which is Christians, it is Jesus Christ. He is the one who lives within us. The Bible tells us he is the wellspring of joy in our life. And out of an understanding of that joy that Jesus brings to us, we ought to be able to laugh at any time in the midst of any service. It's not that we laugh at or even with everything that goes on in our world. But with this source of joy in us, we ought to be able to at any moment, at any time in our life. And so we have been looking over the last few weeks at the book that the primary theme is the subject of joy. It's the book of Philippians. Paul wrote this letter from a prison cell. He was incarcerated when he wrote it. And so I love the fact that this validates what he writes is he's not talking about something that is pie in the sky. He's not talking about something that is surreal. He is talking about reality in the midst of horrible circumstances, in the midst of adversity. Paul writes about the reality of joy that he is experiencing and enjoying in the midst of what he is going through. And in verses 12 through 21... I believe Paul lays out for us seven things about adversity in our lives that it would do well for us to learn. Let me highlight those seven things. We have, uh, we've looked at four of them, and today we're going to kind of highlight four and five uh, and six, and then next week we'll wrap it up with the seventh one. But here are the seven things that Paul teaches us in verses 12 through 21 of chapter 1. Number one, adversity promotes the progress of evangelism. And when I read the passage in just a moment, remember that. See if you can't find where he talks about that in this passage. In other words, in spite of bad times, there is good news that we can share. Number two, adversity provides opportunity for sharing personally, one-on-one. -on -one. You see, it's when we are going through difficult times and other folks notice a peace that they don't have in their difficult times. When they see hope, when we are going through a season that ought to produce despair, when we find ourselves content in any and every circumstance, then people are going to do what Peter suggests they will do in his letter in 1 Peter where he says, be ready to give every person an answer for the hope that is in you. People will ask in those adverse moments, how do you live that kind of life? We have an opportunity to share personally. Number three, adversity produces courage in the faith family. When others in God's family see how you were allowing Christ to function in you in the midst of your trouble, that teaches them and excites them about what God can do in them. And as you are sharing the faith and the confidence of Christ in your moment, it motivates us to want to share him in our moments. Number four, adversity proves the character of our relationships. No member of God's family, and I'm not talking about member of New Hope. You filled out the paperwork, you know, had the meeting with Mark, got the board to vote on you. No, 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 no. That's a temporal thing. We do that because the state of California tells us we have to do it. You're part of God's family if you have Christ living in you. You're part of this fellowship and part of God's family if you show up once. 
Now, you're not part of the fellowship if you don't show up because we don't know you're there to fellowship with, all right? You kind of, that process, but you're part of his family. And, and in this particular one, that there should not be any fair weather members in God's family. You know what fair weather friends are, right? They're the ones who, long as good times are happening, they hang out with you, but when the trouble comes, they don't show up. That ought not to be true in God's family. Now, the flip side of that is, folks, if you got trouble in your world, you need to let us know. None of our staff are mind readers. So when there's trouble, you need to let somebody know. And we're to be there together. Adversity provokes maturity in our lives. Okay? Just like lifting weights produces strength in our arms, so adversity provokes maturity, growth, strength in our lives. Number six, adversity purifies our motives. Not everybody preaches Jesus with the right motives. Paul talks about that. But as we go through adversity, we can improve our motives. Number seven, adversity prepares us with a new perspective about both life and death. I don't know if any of you have ever given much thought to what the responsibility and the job of the church family is all about. What is the job of the church? I, somebody whispered out loud, I like that, yeah, seeing folks saved, that's absolutely correct. Telling people about Jesus. Uh, sometimes we think the job of the church is to impact the church. But I want to make it very clear that we need to understand the job of the church is to impact the world. The responsibilities of what we do in the context of what we may call church gatherings is to prepare us to impact the world as soon as we get off the property. Church is kind of like a huddle in a football game. It's football season, right? Bulldogs just lost a heartbreaker last night, didn't they? How many of you stayed up to watch it through two overtimes? God bless you. That's why you didn't show up at the 8 o'clock service, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I turned it off at the end of the third quarter. Woke up about 2 a.m. I already had it set, you know, on my phone, and I pushed the button. Ooh, we lost. Okay, went back to sleep. But, man, what a game, all right? What a game. Um, I don't know if there's any 49er fans left around or not, but if, <laughs> if you're a 49er fan and you wanted to go to Levi Stadium to watch a game, you're going to pay anywhere from $180 to $500 for a seat. Okay, I, I, just, I just Googled it last night, all right? That's what you're going to pay for a seat. You can get about 68,100 people in Levi Stadium, all of them paying, unless somebody gave them a gift, 200 up bucks and up. I am pretty confident that nobody pays that kind of money to go to a football game and watch the 49ers huddle all game. Recently, that might actually be better than watching them actually play a game, but <laughs> I, I am a 49er fan, guys, all right? Joe Montana days. So what if you went to a 49er game for two and a half hours and you watched 11 men stand in a circle and talk? It's not what you pay for. What you pay for is to see if the play called in secret does its work in public. And that is the challenge for us as the church. It is not what we do when we call our Sunday morning huddle, but it is what we do when we break the huddle, head out into the world from our Sunday morning assignment. How are we going to respond when Satan lines up against us? When adversity confronts us and invades our world, what difference does it make that we are Christians? That's the core of what Paul is talking about in this passage. Let me read the verses. Beginning at verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. All right? Good news and bad times. And as a result, it's become clear through the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. 
because of my chains. Most of the brothers in the Lord, they've been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously. Courage in the faith family. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latters do so in love, knowing I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in change. But what does it matter? Purifying our motives here. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed or fearful, but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Number five, adversity, and I realize I highlighted a little bit of this last week, and we're just going to do this as review and then move on. Victor Frankl, who was a prisoner of war, said a weak faith is often weakened by predicaments and catastrophes, whereas a strong faith is strengthened by them. As I reminded you last week, I have often said the middle of a tragedy is not the best time for a theology lesson. And the reason for that is because often the noise of frustration screaming in our head is so loud that we can't hear the whisper of the Spirit in our soul. And I went off on a little unprepared. What I mean by unprepared is it wasn't in my notes last week. But I thought it was important that I spend a little time, and maybe it was just for your daughter last week that, that, that I spent the time. I, I gave the theology lesson. And I realized that some who were in the service going through adversity right then, what I taught may not have been meaningful because we are so frustrated with adversity. But there are minimally four reasons why bad things happen in this world, and I, I, I won't have time today to amplify on them. I'll just hit the key points. Number one, we do stupid things. That's why bad things happen. Number two, other people do stupid things. That's why they happen to us. Number three, God does it for our growth. And number four, sin is prevalent in the world and it rains on the just and the unjust. So the question is, what or who do you and I rely on to get through the hard times in our life? All of us put our faith in something or someone, and where is ours? Is it in job, career, education, family members, relationships, the stock market? What do we rely on? You see, whatever our answer is, that is where our faith is. We often invest our time, our money, our energy in what we believe in, what we believe is going to make us the happiest, what we think will get us through life with the most advantages, whatever we give our attention to. That is what we choose to believe in. You see, where our thoughts are, that is where our faith is. Everybody has faith in something. Our actions tell the truth about where our faith really is. For many, their words say their faith is in one place, but actions speak a much louder truth. How we live shows what or who we believe in. Faith is simply trust and confidence instead of doubt and fear. If you have genuine faith, we don't really need courage to face the storms of life without fear. It is faith. You see, here's why. Here's why faith is more important than courage. There will be some moments of adversity that will overpower your courage. There will be some situations that will be bigger than what your courage can handle. But nothing is bigger than God if he is the one who you have put your faith in. And so when we cannot possibly stand against that thing, we rest our faith in Jesus Christ. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, The gods we worship write their names on our faces. Be sure of that. It behooves us to be careful who or what we worship, for what we are worship, worshiping is who we are becoming. 
As Paul faced the adversity of the circumstances in Philippians chapter 1, he saw some advantages to this adversity. When he spoke of these events resulting in his salvation, he was not talking about his, his conversion experience on the road to Damascus when he became a Christian, but he's now talking about what has happened since then in chapter 1 verse 6, that God who began a good work on the first day will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until the day I die, I die and go home to be with Jesus or until Jesus comes back and gets me. As Paul looked at his confinement, he saw it as another method of bringing him a step further in his Christian maturity. You know part of what Paul is saying to us here? Don't stay a spiritual baby. He's saying, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to grow up. I've, I've held you. I've nursed you. I've coddled you. And all you still want to do is drink from a bottle. I've, I've been preparing meat for you, but you refuse to, 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 to eat it on your own. You still want me to hold you, and you still want me to bottle feed you. He talks about this in Hebrews. He said, it's time you get off the milk. It's time you get off pablum. It's time you get a knife and fork and you, you eat from God's steaks. It's time to be a meat eater, folks. I'm sorry to you vegetarians. I'm speaking spiritually here, all right? Speaking spiritually here. He didn't say, he probably didn't carry the same picture in those days. It's time you eat your potatoes, your broccoli. So it's time you eat meat. In other words, it's time to grow up, folks. There were three things at work in his life to accomplish this goal. Paul tells us in these verses, first of all, what's bringing about my spiritual maturity is that you, my friends, are praying for me. Paul knew the Philippians were his cheerleaders. They were in his corner. Earlier in this letter, Paul said, I pray in verse 9. Now he's depending on the fact that they were praying for him as well. In fact, in almost all of the letters that Paul wrote, Paul cites the mutuality of prayer. What he himself practiced for them, he was so thrilled that they practiced for him. In Romans chapter 1, it says, I make mention of you in my prayers. Now, thank you for striving together as you pray for me. In Ephesians, he said, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you of my prayers. But finally, my brothers, pray always for me. First Thessalonians, he said, I make mention of you in my prayers night and day. Thank you, brethren, for praying for me. Second Thessalonians, he says, we pray for you always. The last part of that book, he says, finally, my friends, thank you for praying for us. Who are we? Who are we to each other? We spent a little time, life, life in the church, sharing a host of needs. Who are we to each other? Are we each other's cheerleaders? That bulletin is given to you to take home. Read it. But I don't know that person. You don't have to. You know the same God. You're part of the same church. And who knows, maybe if you pray for them, when you bump into them the next Sunday, you say, oh, I just prayed for you. Ooh, what would that do for you, Dan, if somebody who had never met you, and I said, Dan, I just prayed for you last week. <sighs> Chest gets a little bigger. Walk gets a little lighter. Adversity hadn't changed, but you know that people are loving and caring for you. Are, are we each other's cheerleaders or complain leaders? It's easy to complain, not quite as easy to cheer, and I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's the same reason we find it easier to frown than we do to smile. But Paul says we need to be each other's cheerleaders. Often when we face trouble, we need to become the focus of the prayers of God's people. It is through these prayers that we, we get through our crises and move to maturity. As members of God's family, we should not forget to put the spiritual growth of others at the top of our prayer list. We often pray for each other's surgeries and health needs and physical struggles. Do we pray for each other's spiritual well-being? God, I pray for, for, I, I pray for Jim that, that his faith will get stronger as he goes through this. That's what Paul's talking about. The second thing Paul said in this passage was he was not only sustained by the prayers of his friends, but also encouraged by the provision of the Holy Spirit. 
His language is picturesque here. It literally means the full supply of the Holy Spirit is available to us. If you have ever known the Holy Spirit's strength in moments of crisis, then you understand why he is called the comforter. David Jacobson was a hostage in Beirut for 17 months. He was head of the largest hospital in West Beirut when one day in 1985, three hooded men wielding machine guns took most of, uh, of his time on, and spent most of his time on a cold dirt floor, chained to a wall. Once a day, he was fed an unpalatable mush of water, rice, and lentils. As an American, Jacobson was hated by his captors. He was just a political pawn and he was treated cruelly. Instead of breaking his spirit, however, he became stronger in his faith. And he wrote these words. I have discovered that no one's faith has been weakened by the hell we find ourselves in. We hostages have founded the church of the locked door. What a name. He said, we grasp hands, we quote scripture, and we pray together. Oddly, our guards seemed to respect us more. Our togetherness in prayer showed me that when the Holy Comforter is called, he answers. Jacobson was released in November of 1986, but in his final 45 days of captivity, he was alone in a six-by-six-foot cell. His muscles and joints had cramped by confinement and the damp, aching cold. Yet he said, the presence of God, the great comforter, was stronger than ever. The third thing Paul says, assisted him in his time of adversity was his own determination. It was the third dynamic at work during this time of confinement. And I need to pause just a minute. I couldn't find a better word to define this than determination. I, I, but I need to clarify, and hopefully as I explain, it'll make more sense. This is not pull yourself up by your bootstraps, positive thinking determination. This is a Christian maturity, willful choice because being singularly focused on Christ determination, all right? This is not I can muscle through this. It's not because my will is stronger than the problem that I'm facing. It is because I am so in love with God that the desires of my heart determine the outcome of my choices. You see, Paul was confident that he would come through this ordeal and see his friends in Philippi again, but... He was okay if he didn't. He said, whether I live or whether I die, I'm okay. To describe his attitude, he used three elements wrapped up in its meaning. It's made up of the words, away, the head, and to watch. Together, they convey the idea of watching something so intently that your head turned away from everything else. Paul had a singular focus in his life. His earnest expectation and hope were mixed with great determination. Determined choices from a single focus. Number one, he was determined to keep a clear conscience. The scripture says that in nothing shall I be ashamed, shall I be afraid. Even though under pressure in a Roman prison, Paul was determined to live a holy and righteous life. He did not want to use adversity as an excuse for a spiritual backsliding or fear. Paul said, in the midst of this trouble, as bad as it is, I don't want it to be an excuse for me to, to fall away from Christ. His second determination was to keep a courageous testimony. He says, with all boldness as always, as before in my life, when I stood in the streets of Philippi and I had my freedom, now in my confinement I want to be just as bold. Paul was determined that this adversity would be an opportunity to powerfully proclaim the name of Christ. While many are silenced by adversity, Paul actually turned up the volume. Number three, Paul wanted to be determined to keep a Christ-centered focus. The chains, the guards, the prison cell, the trial pending. He didn't want to be distracted by any of that. He wanted to keep his focus 
on Christ. Christ will be magnified in my body, he says, whether I live or whether I die. From the human viewpoint, Paul's body was fairly useless to him since he was chained to a soldier 24 hours every day. But Paul saw beyond all of that, he was determined that both his body and his circumstances would be a vehicle to magnify Jesus Christ. In one of his letters to the young preacher Timothy, Paul described a situation like this. I suffer trouble just like an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. Guy Keane suggests some of the ways that our bodies can magnify the Lord. He says Christ magnified in the body, magnified by lips that bear joy-filled testimony of him, magnified by hands employed in his service, Magnified by feet that are only too happy to run the errands of God. Magnified by shoulders. Happy to bear together the burdens of each other. When we magnify Christ, we do not do it microscopically. A microscope takes that which is little and it magnifies to make it big in our vision. Folks, you and I need to understand our Lord is not little. (laughs) He's a big, big God. We must magnify him not microscopically, but telescopically. We must take the Lord who for many seems to be so far away. And in our adversity, we need to bring them close to the God who lives within us. Quite often the Lord uses adversity in our lives as the lens through which he can be seen by others. In the process of it all, he is developing our character so that we will be reflectors of his glory. And Paul teaches us that character cannot be developed from the lazy boy. It is only through the experiences of trials, suffering, does our souls often get stronger. Helen Keller suffered an illness at 18 months that left her completely blind and deaf. For five years, she was isolated from the world and alone in her darkness. With the help of the woman most of us remember from history or our own readings, with the help of Ann Sullivan, Helen fought back against her handicap. She never pitied herself. She never gave up. She said, the marvelous richness of human experience would lose something of its rewarding joy if there were no limitations to overcome. The hilltop hour would be half as wonderful if there were not dark valleys to get through. Some of you were here four years ago last month. Actually, I preached the sermon four years ago this month. The dark night of my soul. I had never had to deal personally. I've dealt with plenty of others in my family and friends of personal challenge, but never had dealt with a physical challenge of my own until stents and some complications. And that Wednesday night, I remembered it was a long, hard night. If it hadn't have been for the 23rd Psalm coming to my attention and me choosing finally, finally to focus my attention there and away from everything else that was going on, that I find relief and comfort. I, I got to be honest, folks. I look back on that night. I got a C minus or a D plus. And I've thought many, many times about that night since then. I wished I had known then these seven principles that Paul illustrates about what adversity is to do for us. And from my less than stellar grade of four years ago, my prayer is, is God, next time that happens in my world, I don't want it to take so long for me to look to the shepherd who walks with me through the valleys of adversity and trouble. I don't want it to be four or five hours. I don't want it to be four or five minutes. I want it to be only about four or five seconds. But I wouldn't have that to learn from if I hadn't been through the adversity. Number six, adversity purifies our motives. And what most scholars think is the key verse of this entire chapter, this entire letter, Paul stated his life, motive, and mission very clearly. He said, 
for me to live as Christ, to die as gain. No wonder his life had such power and momentum to it. He forced every experience of his life through this grid of this personal life statement. He knew he, who he was all about. The suffering of a situation was not intolerable because he saw how God would not waste it for his own stated purpose. When we who are who we are supposed to be, if we understand why we are here and we know where we are going, we can confidently face the day and even the difficulties with a new sense of purpose. As Alec Moyer illustrates, everything should become something for Jesus. Let me say that again. Everything should become something for Jesus. He writes this. Two friends were talking together, one older and wiser, the other younger and passing through a severe testing time. The older friend with loving wisdom said, no moment ever again will be like this one. Let there be something for Jesus in this moment. It is not something for Jesus if we dwell on our miseries, nor if we let... Opportunities pass without a word about the sufficiency of our Lord. Nor if we think that, that any, other, any hand other than his brought us to this place. It is something for Jesus if we think and speak about him and his purpose. It is something for him if we acknowledge and trust his sovereign will. Cheryl. Cheryl was a young mom who struggled with a serious illness. In the midst of her struggle, she was determined to keep ministering grace to others. She wasn't looking for others to minister grace to her. She genuinely wanted to use her moment for Christ. Cheryl went to be with Jesus on November the 19th, 2003. She was 44 years old. Cheryl's friends say she lived out Philippians 1.21 for me to live as Christ and to die as gain like no one they had ever seen before. Cheryl wrote a poem back in 1984, 19 years before she died, long before she had her illness. Listen to what she wrote. Cheryl said, remember me, remember me, not for who I was, but for who Jesus was in me. Remember me, not for the things that I've done, but for the things that Jesus did through me. Remember me not as the one who loved, without remembering, he first loved us. Remember me not as one who gave, but as one to whom much was given. Remember me not as one who spoke of God, but as one who knew God through his son, the Lord Jesus. Remember me not as one who prayed, but remember the one to whom I prayed. Remember me not as the one who was strong, but as one who cried out to God to be my strength. Remember me, not as one who died, but as one who lives forever, because I have believed in Jesus. Remember not my life, nor my death, for remembering those will profit you nothing, but please, Remember the life and the death of Jesus. For he gave his life that we might live. He died that we might, might never have to. And he rose again that we might have a forever life. Remember not me, but do remember Jesus. Wow. She was only in her 30s when she wrote those things. Guys, spiritual maturity doesn't have to wait and come when you've got snow on the mountaintop. It can come at any moment in your life if we don't waste the opportunities. 
That was a young woman who had a singular focus of Christ in her life, even in the midst of adversity. There's an old Motel 6 commercial that says they'll leave the light on for you. Jesus told his disciples in the closing week of his life, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a room for you. The light is always on in the father's house and it shines from his windows from heaven to your life on earth. But we'll only see that light shine if we have a singular focus of for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I wish I could tell you that becoming a Christian would remove all the adversity in your life, but I would be a liar if I told you that. But I can with great assurance tell you, no matter the adversity that you experience in life, Christ is sufficient in and for and through you and your family and your friends as you face your adversity. Try to imagine facing it all on your own. To those of you who at this very moment, life is good. Adversities are minimal or absent. You are the cheerleaders for those who are going through adversity. You pray for them. You encourage them. You live in front of them. The life of Christ in and through you. Let's pray. Father, I wish joy was just about happy times. I wish life was just Disneyland every moment of every day. But Father, to get to Disneyland from here, we've got to go over a mountain range. Sometimes there's snow on it, and sometimes there's sleet, and sometimes there's accidents, and sometimes we blow a tire. Sometimes getting from here to heaven, there's going to be adversity and there's going to be trouble. But Father, I'll never forget blowing a tire at the top of, all of a sudden I can't remember what the pass going to L.A. And I thought, oh my goodness, there's no way in the world I can change this tire on this busy highway without being destroyed. 30 seconds later a big white truck pulled up and the guy said let me change that tire for you and in the back of his truck he had all the resources to get it done in a way that was absolutely impossible for me and dear Jesus if Caltrans could figure out how to do that in the state of California then I think you from heaven can figure out how to take care of our adversities as we live this life on earth we just need to have eyes to see and ears to hear and a faith, not a lot, but as pure as a mustard seed that says, God, I can't, but you can. You never said I could, but you always said you would, and I'm going to let you. Do it in me right now. Father, thank you that you're big enough for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Go have a great day.